Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So last week, I was watching one of my favorite shows when I have a little bit of time. I was watching Glee. I like Glee. It's fun. It's silly. It's smart writing. It's great songs. Vaudeville-like. Awesome. And last week, Glee participated in one of those classic American traditions. Rehab. How so? Because starring on Glee, the centerpiece and the theme of all the songs was Britney Spears. And if there is anyone who is in need of a little bit of rehabilitation, Britney Spears would fall into that category. But let's face it, it was on Glee and it was fun and lovely because we as Americans love rehab. We love the stories of stars or politicians who have attained a level of success and then come burning down. We love how they go down. We love the way they self-implode. But we love it even more when they begin to pick themselves up again. Rehab and our appreciation of it as a culture is, as I said, an American tradition. And therefore, I would like to engage and bring a little bit of that tradition here to our sanctuary this morning as I would like to attempt nothing less than a small bit of rehabilitation for one of the most besmirched characters, at least in rabbinic literature, and that is Noah. Now, in what way, you ask, is he besmirched? In what way does he need rehabilitation? Let me explain. In the Torah portion, Noah seems to come off pretty well. He is described in the very beginning as an ish tzaddik tamim, as a, a pure and righteous man. However, though that merits his being the only human being deserving of salvation by God as God reverts creation and floods the world, the rabbis can't help but notice when they compare Noah to next week's hero, Abraham, then Noah kind of comes up a little bit short. Because here is Noah being told by God that God is going to flood the world and wipe out all humanity. And what does Noah say in response? Well, if you go according to Bill Cosby, his one big response is, what's a cubit? He does not plead for humanity. He does not seek their salvation. Whereas Abraham, when faced with the knowledge of the destruction of but two towns, Sodom and Gomorrah, immediately begins in a give and take with God to seek the salvation of but those two towns. Noah doesn't say one word about all humanity, whereas Abraham fights for the life of all those inhabitants. The rabbis can't help but notice that. We should not overlook it. And therefore, picking up on the word Bedorotav in his generation, because the full description of Noah at the very beginning of the Torah portion is Noah's a ish tzaddik tamim haya bedorotav, that he was a righteous and good man in his generation. The rabbis note, yes, in his generation he was a good guy, but in Abraham's generation he wouldn't have even gotten noticed. In his generation, he was a good person, but quite frankly, given his generation corrupting the entire ways of the earth to such an extent that God felt God had to destroy the whole earth, being a good guy isn't saying that much. It's in fact a pretty low bar when you're considered a good person in a generation that merits the world's entire destruction. And so within rabbinic literature, Noah is not viewed very positively. He's not embraced by the rabbis. He's accepted for who he is, but we do not look upon him in the same kind of adoration that the rabbis will pile upon Abraham. And yet I would like to suggest that Noah is perhaps treated a little harshly by early rabbinic tradition. I would like to suggest that we can see at least in one small deed of his a level of kindness and compassion 
that we could all learn from and incorporate into our lives. Of what do I speak? As you may know, Noah gets all the animals onto the ark. The floodwaters come and they cover the entire world. There is nothing to be seen but water wherever you look. And eventually God will stop the flooding and the waters will begin to recede. So what does Noah do? He takes a raven and he sends the raven out to see if there's any dry land, if the raven will come back with anything. But the raven doesn't. And so he sends out later on another bird. He will send out the dove, a shy and timid bird, according to rabbinic tradition. He'll send out the dove, and the dove will fly. But what does the dove find first time around? Nothing. And so the dove flies back, and here the Torah is very precise with its language. The dove will fly back to the ark. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a bird, and I had been flying around looking for a place to land, found nowhere to land, and I was coming back to the one bit of dry earth that existed in that ark, I would not fly back to the ark. I would fly back into the ark. But that's not the picture that the Torah paints. On the contrary, the language is very specific. The dove flies back to the ark and sits there hovering, waiting, until, as the Torah says, Noah extends his arm and brings the dove in. Noting that small interplay, Harav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda, also known as the Natsiv, who was the head of the Velozhin Yeshiva in the middle 1800s for over 40 years, reading it carefully, he says, look how awesome Noah is. Look how great he is. Look how compassionate he is. For the dove had failed on its mission. Noah had sent the dove out to find dry land, and the dove didn't do it. Now, it wasn't the dove's fault. The dry land wasn't to be had. But still, he says, the dove failed. And that explains, he says, why the dove flies to the ark and hovers and waits. Because the dove is not certain how Noah is going to take his failure. 